Good evening and welcome to Regent College and to tonight's evening public lecture. My name is David Robinson and I am an adjunct professor of theology and ethics here at Regent. On behalf of the community, I'd like to extend to you a warm welcome. And while we're not quite holding these lectures in person yet, I'm here at the college and would like to acknowledge the land on which Regent College, an affiliate of the University of British Columbia, is based, is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Let me briefly explain the format for tonight, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Our lecturer will speak for approximately 50 minutes, and then rather than taking questions, since this event is being pre-recorded, Tonight's lecture will be followed by a short Q&A conversation with the lecturer and a small audience of students and alumni. Our evening together will end around 9 p.m. PDT at the latest. Now I have the privilege of introducing tonight's distinguished lecturer. Bruce Hindmarsh, known to many of you, is the James M. Houston Professor of Spiritual Theology at Regent. He holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford, is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and a past president of the American Society of Church History. Professor Heinmarsh is author of three books, including most recently, The Spirit of Early Evangelicalism, True Religion in a Modern World, which was published by the Oxford University Press in 2018. He has also spoken widely on the history of early British evangelicalism. And I think this is such an important endeavor today, for as James Houston has said, contemporary confusion is often the result of ah historicism, which is to say we don't understand our present because we haven't taken our bearings properly from the past. It's therefore fitting that as the holder of the Houston chair, Bruce Heinmarsh counters this trend by not only re-narrating our history, but relating it to pressing contemporary concerns. And he does so with scholarly rigor and stylistic grace. All this to say, you're in for a treat. This evening, Dr. Heinmarsh's lecture is entitled, You Have Never Talked to a Mere Mortal, The Implications of a Negative Theological Anthropology. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Heinmarsh. Well, thank you, David, and it's a delight to be with you all. Um, uh, in this format and uh, to talk about these things together. Um, I don't know if you can dedicate, you dedicate a book, I don't know if you can dedicate a public lecture, but I'm, uh, just as you were talking, David, I'm thinking about our dear friend Jim Houston at 98 years of age, and I think I want to dedicate uh, the next 45 minutes in this conversation to him and um, the ways he's been an inspiration to us all, thinking about a personalist um, anthropology. And increasingly in recent years, his concern for theological anthropology, what it means to be human. So the title of my lecture this evening is You Have Never Talked to a Mere Mortal, The Implications of a Negative Theological Anthropology. And the part of the subtitle there, Negative Anthropology, is something we'll get to more towards the end. But I would like to explore with you two things. First of all, how in our modern world, we've come to understand ourselves in ways that are reduced, contracted, compared with the ancients. And then uh, secondly, how a properly theological anthropology, thinking about human persons theologically, can enlarge our reverence for one another and chasten the claims that we make about being human beings. If you like, we will first deflate human nature like a balloon or an air mattress, and then we'll reinflate it with air, with help from another age. Um, and there's sort of two sections here then. So first of all, um, first of all, modern anthropology will look at the conditions that shape our understanding of what it's to be human. We'll look at categories, ideas that shape our understanding of what is to be human. And then I'm going to spend most of my time on, uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear on calculations or measurements that we take that influence how we understand um, what it is to be, um, what it is to be human. So that's kind of where we're going. So first of all, modern conditions. Modern conditions for human life, such as rapid transportation, instant long distance communication, the consumer economy, 
and so on. This has generated an implied anthropology that is written in letters almost too large to read. You can't see it. The taken for granted conditions of modern life are like the frame for a painting and the subject of the painting is you, it's us. For example, moving around rapidly without our feet touching the ground means that we are uniquely mobile as never before in history. Or again, as Jürgen Habermas has pointed out, the communications conditions of the modern world, this has generated a whole new form of subjectivity. Rather than discovering ourselves as persons in communion, we find that we are publicum besogen. Doesn't that German word sound great? Publicum besogen. We are audience-oriented subjects. We understand as subjects oriented to an audience. There are many other conditions. I'm sure you can think of them. Technology, ubiquitous, 24 seven media and social media, globalization, global supply chains, modern financial systems of great complexity and so on and so on. These conditions shape our self understanding as capable, self-determining agents, agents in the modern world. Even more specifically, modernity has been described as faith in systems, all sorts of systems that we're enmeshed in. And so it seems that we do find ourselves increasingly to be a certain kind of agent, system dependent, system integrated agents. We depend on medical systems, financial systems, welfare systems, educational systems, technological systems, and let it not be forgotten, endless telephone call centers. G.K. Chesterton published a book over 100 years ago with the title, What's Wrong with the World? He answered his own question. The huge modern heresy, he said, is altering the human soul to fit its conditions instead of altering human conditions to fit the human soul. So these conditions are not neutral. My colleague, Craig Gay, has done as much as anyone to help us understand these modern conditions in a series of, um, I think, outstanding studies and analyses, his various books on modernity, money, language, technology. And he's aware in all of these works of the steady conversion of quality to quantity in many, many spheres that's at the root of modernity. Well, these taken for granted conditions shape our self-understanding, don't they? But in addition to modern conditions, there's also this set of modern categories for understanding human nature. And these also act to reduce the human agent in comparison to pre-modern times. Modern categories, we could trace and we could do this in great detail, but I just wanna, I wanna get on to talking about measurement. So I'm gonna just do this in outline. The rational human in Rene Descartes, I think therefore I am. The sovereign human in Thomas Hobbes were my, my body itself, I'm like the king or a sovereign over a nation. I I'm, I'm, have, have human rights and self-determination. The empirical human in John Locke and David Hume, I'm a bundle of perceptions in the present moment, a cross-section of my own consciousness. The choosing human in Francis, Francis Hutchinson and other moral sense philosophers, fundamentally a moral agent acting on the world, or the economic human in Adam Smith, rational economic man advancing his own condition and contributing to public good and so on. These kinds of reductions that are operating in early modern thought, all of them continue to influence us today. We could think, you know, people are basically cognitive. People are basically self-determining. People are basically a bundle of perceptions. People are basically agents who make choices. People are basically consumers. We still feel the force of these accounts of human nature that came in with the enlightenment. And we could carry the story on up to our own times with other categories and ideas that have circumscribed human personhood within narrow bounds. In particular, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, the so-called masters of suspicion, have done much to intensify the alienation of the self in later modern and postmodern thought often specifically being 
the human as an avatar for class categories. But without question, the conditions on the ground and the leading ideas of the modern period together, they have contracted, deflated our sense of what it is to be human. There's maybe a heightened sense of agency, but in ways that I hope I can show you compared to pre-modern times, there is a deflation. We will contrast this later with the vastness of the pre-modern Christian soul. But before that, I want to deal with this third category and spend more time on this, the way self-understanding as human beings has contracted by the way we view human beings more and more through the lens of quantitative measurement. Not just modern conditions and modern categories, but modern calculation. As I say, I'll spend a little bit more time on this because I think it's suddenly very topical. During this past year, we have all become armchair epidemiologists. Perhaps this can make us more aware, more aware of the importance in modernity of converting qualities to quantities. An alien researcher from a distant galaxy observing us this past year would surely notice all the data collection, the statistical analysis of risk, the medical testing at scale, the modeling and projecting and steady reporting of case counts, hospitalizations, and deaths. I'm not here wanting to engage in debate about the accuracy of PCR tests, um, the accuracy of modeling, the efficacy of public health measures, and so on. But I want instead just to observe that something happens when we develop a habit of abstracting human beings as interchangeable data points on a statistical array. Modernity has in many ways granted human beings an unprecedented sense of control over nature. And the appearance and spread of a novel coronavirus was a shock to all the modern systems that deliver this control, especially at first. Do you remember? We wondered, would the financial system collapse? Would fiscal and monetary interventions stabilize markets, stave off hyperinflation, avoid deflation and prevent a great depression? With supply chains collapse and render daily life precarious, who can forget the hoarding of toilet paper? Would the medical system be overwhelmed? Would our educational systems be able to continue? Would the welfare system be robust enough to cope with mass unemployment? And on and on. A microscopic pathogen suddenly exposed the taken for granted quality of modern life as much more fragile than we ever imagined. In our time of crisis, modern human beings did not turn so much to art, culture, or religion, or to local observation, wisdom, inference, and anecdote, as to massive data collection and analysis at scale. This tells us something about ourselves. This is how we hope to reassert control and prevent system failure. I suspect, however, and this is, this is how I want to think about this, because there's all sorts of questions, of course, about specific public policy and so on. But I suspect something happens to us when we really begin to indwell the sort of epidemiological modeling that we've been subject to daily for the past year and more. I cease to live the life present to me immediately here in my own body, in this moment, in this place, with my own unique history. The philosopher and social critic Ivan Illich spoke prophetically, therefore, in the 1990s when he said, quote, in the most intense way, disembodiment happens through what we call risk awareness. If anybody should ask me, he said, what is the most important religiously celebrated ideology today, I would say the ideology of risk awareness. What did he mean? He said, why is risk so disembodying? because it is a strictly mathematical concept. It is placing myself each time I think of risk into a base population for which certain events, future events can be calculated. It's an invitation to intensive self algorithmization, not only disembodying, but reducing myself entirely to misplaced concreteness and projecting myself on a curve. That's Ivan Illich. I've been reading all, all of Ivan Illich since the pandemic started. He's, I think, quite an interesting um, critic to read. But his compound word, self-algorithmization, 
perfectly describes, I think, the pandemic discourse this past year as we locate ourselves repeatedly in the daily reporting of cases we're now in the percentage of the population vaccinated and so on. During the past year, my father's health declined to the place where he entered hospice care. His body was shattered. He had advanced cancer and advanced Parkinson's and a pathological break in some of his bones. And for seven months, we visited him as we were permitted and with protocols and so on. But it was a holy privilege to be present to him and share in his utterly unique experience of suffering and consolation and expectation of his coming death and entry into life eternal in the presence of Christ for seven months. We were with him to the end and the last words he heard were me saying, I love you, dad. Well, of course, um, to me, to all of us, he was never merely a bundle of risk factors or the sum of quantitative medical tests or a component within the medical system. The last days of his life were certainly not experienced as measurable qualies, Q-A-L-Y-S. For those of you who have not heard this term, qualies are units in actuarial calculations used not just by insurance people, but widely in public health so-called quality adjusted life years where the year of death counts as zero since the quality of life is pretty bad at that point. And a year of perfect health counts as one. Qualities let you make calculations and crucially treat human beings as interchangeable and replaceable for the assessment of health policy and budgets and insurance. So no, our experience of my father in hospice had nothing to do with such calculations. My father's life was utterly irreplaceable, non-interchangeable, uniquely complex, utterly beyond the sort of knowing that involves p-values, confidence intervals, and odds ratios. Hear me, I'm not saying that quantitative analysis has no place in our society. Far from it. But what I'm arguing is that it must be chastened, circumscribed by a deeper anthropology. Where did this quantitative approach to human life come from? A historian always is going to ask those questions. Where did this come from? We can trace the turn towards quantitative measurement and risk analysis historically. The effort to calculate an uncertain future, to calculate an uncertain future, goes back to the mathematicians Blaise Pascal and Pierre de Fermat, in the 17th century. They exchanged letters working out how to calculate the odds of rolling double sixes with a dice given several chances. They also worked on the so-called problem of the points, which is actually quite fascinating. It involved calculating how you divide a pot of money where a wager has been placed, but you stop partway through the game. You need to know all the possible outcomes and give them percentages and so on. You have to calculate the precise odds for how the game could possibly finish. And they solved the problem of the points. Indeed, the first practical application of probability risk calculation was to gambling by figures such as the English entrepreneur John Law, who made vast sums of money playing cards around Europe before finally becoming a successful banker for a period and establishing the first central bank in France. I find it sort of humorous that he goes from being a gambler to a central banker. Soon these calculations were applied to the probability of death, um, the probability of death to uh, quantify risk for government issued annuities where the government was effectively placing a bet on how long the annuitant would live. In um, January, 1693, the mathematician and astronomer Edmund Haley tackled the problem in a piece called An Estimate of the Degrees of the Mortality of Mankind. You don't get titles like this anymore. It's a long title. Drawn from curious tables of births and funerals in the city of Breslau with an attempt to ascertain the price of annuities upon lives. The city of Breslau had collected detailed data on mortality, including crucially data of the age at death. Haley immediately re realized that he could use this data to model probabilities of death at any interval of years. And importantly, he said 
that to contemplate in death, death in this matter, not just religiously, it had, quote, physical and political uses. Soon others in Scotland were, for example, calculating more exact odds for life insurance. But this was the birth, and it's important to see it, this is the birth of the revolutionary idea that we can predict the future and make decisions accordingly. From the beginning, it's interesting to me that it was in the areas of gambling, finance, and public health that these probability calculations had their first application. Even Pascal's famous wager on the existence of God was framed in these terms as a risk benefit analysis. Pascal wrote in his Pensee, let us examine this point and say God is or he is not, but to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide nothing here. There's an infinite chaos which separates us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What will you wager? Well, he ran this as a probability calculation. And he concluded that a rational person should live as if God exists. For if God does not actually exist, one would only have a finite loss. Whereas if God does exist, one stands to receive infinite reward and avoid infinite losses. It's a probability calculation. His crudely utilitarian wager raises the question of whether there was a temptation for Christians themselves to adapt the new interest in quantitative methods and calculation to advance the cause of Christ. Could spiritual life be accelerated by the use of data? This, of course, is a very contemporary question where institutional life today seems everywhere to be governed by metrics and critical success factors that can be scored and counted. Institutions want to make and be seen to make evidence-based decisions. And so we gather data as never before. We have Googleified ourselves. The history of calculation also intertwines with the history of spirituality, and we can sort of play this forward. There's a long history, like it affects how we think as Christians. Um, there's a long history of interaction between financial record keeping, data collection, and spiritual account keeping, and the metaphors go back and forth. This is a little bit of a detour, and I promise we're going to turn to the question of anthropology, but I want you to see something of how uh, measurement began to figure in the spiritual life itself. In the early medieval period, the rise of tariffed, so-called tariffed penance in Irish, Gallic, and Carolingian piety added an element of precision and calculation to the simple prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Specific sins were given quantifiable, measurable penances. This tariff penance system developed and in the 13th century, this was extended in the midst of the coordinate rise of double entry bookkeeping in Italy and an intensification of sacramental confession and moral fastidiousness. And scholars have traced the development of these things in parallel. Indeed, this is the century where quantification really took off with the first mechanical clock, marine charts for navigation, mathematically defined perspective painting, and these new accounting techniques. And then often right when you balance your checkbook, as it were, to the glory of God, they write a kind of statement about, you know, about that at the top of the ledger. The Gregorian reforms in the church and Italian bookkeeping progressed together with an interest in measurement and quantities. Two centuries later, and uh, let me share a screen here now. Um, uh, two centuries later, Ignatius Loyola wrote his spiritual exercises and included a particular examine. This is an examine of conscience, to, to look at your conscience and examine it it invites the exercitant, the one doing the exercises, to identify a specific besetting sin. Let's say, you know, we have G here for gluttony. And then to look back at midday, and again at the end of the day, making tick marks on a register to indicate precisely how many times this sin has happened. 
Over the course of the week, the hope was that one could see a diminishment, a reduction in the number of tick marks. This was well and truly data being collected and analyzed for spiritual improvement. And I think it bears a remarkable similarity to the medieval tally sticks. Uh, the medieval tally sticks that um, were used for financial record keeping uh, in the period. This is the basis for even in Oxford today, your financial account is called your battles and it's based on these tally sticks. Um, Jesuit spirituality became famous for his casuistical character, its precision about these things. And only relatively recently in the 1970s did Jesuits transform this particular examine of conscience with its fastidiousness into an examine of consciousness that is more focused on discernment than moral bookkeeping. While I have these uh, slides up, I have this out of order, but let me just show you. Um, this is Edmund Haley's um, a document that I referred to where he is calculating uh, mortality rates, and these are some of his tables. So just hold that in your mind for a minute, this, this interest in tabular display. Um, my own research has focused largely on the early evangelical movement and its concern for true religion, for spirituality. And so I asked myself, did they also collect and analyze data for spiritual improvement? Should we? At the very beginning, there's evidence that those who would lead the movement were preoccupied, sometimes obsessively, with measurement. Some of this may have come to them from these same Jesuit sources. For a while, it seemed to me that they would pull the plant out of the ground every few minutes to see if it was growing and measure it. John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and more than a dozen young men at Oxford in the 1730s kept detailed track of their spiritual condition every hour of every day in a tabular format. So here's the one table, Edmund Haley, and here's another form of tabular display in an early Methodist diary, scoring your temper of devotion on a scale of one to nine every hour and resolutions kept and broken. In a similar spirit, the young Jonathan Edwards made a list of 70 detailed resolutions in the 1720s, and he would examine himself minutely each week by these resolutions, keeping a diary to record his effort to keep them, collecting data as it were. The pattern of precise self-assessment was also promoted in popular devotional manuals at the time, such as Philip Doddridge's Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul. Such detailed self-assessment shared in the wider culture of early modern self-management. And it's significant for how we think about ourselves. One of the spiritual handbooks known to several of the early evangelicals counseled keeping a book of spiritual accounts. When I grew up as a church, they talked about keeping short accounts with God. It was still that kind of language. The choice of metaphor here is telling, since it was again, accounting that popularized more exact record keeping, the consumer revolution, commodity money, the expansion of credit in this period hastened these practices of converting quality to quantity right around this time. Some 80 bookkeeping texts, 80 popular bookkeeping texts were published in the 1730s and 40s as the evangelical movement was beginning. And many of these were written for ordinary people. As one of these handbooks remarked, quote, tradesmen's books like the Christian conscience should always be kept clean and neat. And he that is not careful of both will give but a sad account of himself either to God or man. Accounting worked both ways. By such means, there was an intensification in the 18th century of what contemporaries called l'esprit géométrique, or the quantifying spirit of the Enlightenment, including a new obsession with tabular display. There's a direct line here to the methods of the social sciences today. However, the use of numerical measurement and self-examination was for the most part, John Wesley accepted as usual, a short-lived experiment at Oxford. And the early evangelical leaders never did much analysis of the data they collected, as far as I can tell, anyways. In fact, the moral fastidiousness of these young men was the very thing that drove them to self-despair. 
to cast themselves with entire trust on Christ's free and atoning grace, and that led to spiritual breakthrough. Through conversion, each of the key leaders came to see the importance of what Thomas Chalmers would later call the expulsive power of a new affection. The felt presence of the Holy Spirit would be the fire that would melt away scruples and moral fastidiousness. So although they trialed the practice of turning spirituality into measurable quanta, they came finally to realize this is a dead end. They turned instead to qualitative measures of spiritual maturity and growth in grace. So even though this was a, a short-lived experiment with spiritual data, they, they really focused on self-improvement. This was for the individual, not population-based. At the level of populations, assessing spiritually the congregation, the parish, the denomination, they did not collect data. They did not employ any sort of statistical or quantitative, quantitative methods for spiritual growth even though this was beginning to happen in other areas of the political economy, as we have seen with Edmund Haley and the use of the mortality tables. No, when they look, somebody like Jonathan Edwards looks out at his congregation or his community, and they want to evaluate what's happening spiritually, qualitative self-examination is what they did with individuals and with groups. The characteristic approach is to evaluate the character and spiritual maturity of an individual or a community according to certain marks. I suspect this comes from the preparation sermon for Holy Communion if, to examine yourself for a worthy reception and some of those sermons among the Puritans. The writer who contributed most significantly to an evangelical literature of discernment was Jonathan Edwards, beginning with his um, text, The Faithful Narrative in 1737, and then a series of further works he contrasted inadequate criteria for assessment, don't use these criteria, with true and proper criteria, here are the best criteria, and he was trying to discern what criteria are most biblical and you should use. We may take as a specimen his famous work, The Distinguishing Marks of the Work of a Spirit of God in 1741, a Yale commencement address. For Edwards, signs mark such as intense bodily effects, falling down, a deeply impressed imagination. These are uncertain signs of the work of God's spirit. What counted as reliable marks of the presence of the spirit were things like a, a heightened esteem, a higher Christology, a heightened, receipt, a heightened esteem for Christ as savior and Lord, a quickened conscience, an intensified love for scripture, a deeper orthodoxy and increased love for God and neighbor. That's what counted. He was willing to apply these principles empirically to what was going on in New England in 1741, and then to make the prudential judgment that all things considered, something genuine is happening. He made a moral judgment and discernment, but there's no appeal to data as such. Generally, I think this is the way they made their way. They uh, is personal acts of pastoral discernment according to qualitative biblical marks of genuine spirituality. They might have numbers for attendance, for membership and money, but they abandoned statistics when it came to spiritual assessment. Now, for those of you who are scientifically inclined, it may seem everything non-quantifiable is just so much connoisseurship. I think the leaders of the early evangelical movement acted in ways intermediate between these two poles, between, if you like, data-driven science and mere connoisseurship. Discernment involved criteria, and there was a definite shape to the Christian life, but judgment of cases, this required experience, wisdom, and prudence. And the clergyman John Newton tried to describe the general pattern of growth in grace. What, what does it look like generally when people grow in Christ? He paused several times to acknowledge that one could never arrive at pure generalization without distorting things, without distorting the particulars of any one person's experience. The Lord, the Spirit, is sovereign and free in his operations, he said. And though the Spirit gives to all the same view of sin, same view of themselves and the Savior, yet, quote, with respect to the circumstantials of his work, there is, as in the features of our faces, such an amazing variety that perhaps no two persons can be found whose experiences have been exactly alike, end quote. The quantifying spirit that would make the unique 
experience of individuals somehow universal, interchangeable, replaceable. I think he was a wise old man. I like the fact that he compared the uniqueness of each person's, ex person's experience to the uniqueness of each human face. For the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, this was indeed where ethics begins. Prior even to any moral or ethical reasoning, I am confronted by the face of the other, and this commands my reverence. The encounter with the irreplaceable face of another human being is utterly unique and ineffable, and it makes demands upon me. In philosophical language, ontology here precedes ethics. Interestingly, I think Jonathan Edwards actually thought the same. He described the foundation of ethics rather abstractly as the consent of being to being. It's a response to the one who presents, it's a response to what is. Okay, so, so far, this is a good place for us to turn afresh. And um, let me share a screen again here. And um, for us to turn afresh to theological resources to aid us in responding to these reductions. We have noted that there are modern conditions, categories, spent a good amount of time on calculations that all have the effect of shrinking human nature down, deflating it like an inner tube. If we, were, if we return now to pre-modern Christian resources, we find a different way of understanding humanity. Comparatively, earlier believers had a higher, heightened sense of contingency when they thought about human beings a larger sense of transcendence or consciousness of the human is open to transcendence and a more humble approach to epistemology, what may or may not be known. A sense that there's something, our knowledge is bounded by unknowability. To say that something is contingent, let's start there, is to say that it could have been otherwise, that it need not necessarily have been at all. As Bernard of Clairvaux wrote, God is the source of all our being and our well-being. Our finite existence is pure gift, sustained and bounded by the eternal God who chose freely out of love for us to be here at all and to be blessed with his blessedness. He need not have done so. No law of nature compelled him. It was, as St. Paul says to the Ephesians, according to his good pleasure. We do not therefore move through the world like a billiard ball as one object among other objects, nor do we live inside our skin like a Ziploc bag. We have been given a nature capable of loving union with our creator. We are made, as Augustine says, capable of God. The capacity of the finite to rest in the infinite, the creature to rest in the creator, is what gives a bottomless dimension to human nature. Hans Urs von Balthasar writes, our existence as a whole is immersed in a far deeper sea, the bottomless ocean of the love of the Father. So every moment as we move through time and space, we are floating, again, Balthazar, like a ship above the Im immense depths of an entirely different element, namely the unfathomable love of the Father. The sustaining love of the Father is a condition, a profound condition, that can reframe how we think about human beings, even as we live in the midst of modern devices and systems. So with a sense of contingency, we become aware of a bottomless dimension to the world in which we find ourselves, but even more, this contingency is true of us. We might not have been, need not have been. Being ourselves though made capable of God, the human person is quote, a creature with a mystery in his heart that is bigger than himself. That's Balthazar again. If we are made to be in union with our infinite creator, finite though we are, if we are indeed made to be filled with all the fullness of God, as St. Paul says, then our insides are bigger than our outsides. This is why pre-modern writers spoke not of the small enclosed self, just me alone with my thoughts inside my head, but of the unimaginably vast Christian soul. My favorite example of this is comes from Teresa of Avila, who wrote her masterpiece, The Interior Castle, in which she says that she, see, she saw the soul as, as something unutterably vast, 
I don't find anything comparable, she said, to its magnificent beauty, the beauty of a soul and its marvelous capacity. She, she reasoned this way, the place where God lives is paradise. Logically, the soul of the righteous person must be nothing less than paradise. There's a dignity and a beauty of the highest order that we are made to be a capacity to be capable of being a dwelling for the Lord himself. And the soul, like heaven, if it's to be a home for God, it must not only be beautiful, but like Jesus said in John 14, it must be spacious and have many rooms. In my father's house are many mansions. And so Teresa imagines room after room, dwelling place after dwelling place within the interior castle, some rooms up, others down, others to the sides, she says. But most importantly, in the center, in the middle is the main dwelling place where the very secret exchanges between God and the soul take place. This is reinflating our sense of what it is to be a human being. The contrast here to modern anthropology is profound. For Augustine, likewise, the human person has vast dimensions. His whole project in his autobiographical confessions was to explore the recesses and folds of memory to find the God who was always already there, the soul of his soul, the life of his life. He realized not, not only that there was more to God than he could ever fully know, but that there was more to himself made in God's image than he could ever know. He confessed he was not entirely transparent or manifest even to himself. He writes these reflections in the form of a prayer in book 10 of the Confessions. He says, the power of memory, all this inside of me is prodigious, my God. It is a vast, immeasurable sanctuary. Who can plumb its depths? And yet it is a faculty of my soul. Although it is part of my nature, I cannot understand all that I am. And then he gets really confused when he realizes that this means my mind contains something. Um, my mind cannot contain all of my mind. There must be a leftover bit. Where exactly is that bit? He gets exasperated. He says, who is to carry the research beyond this point? Who can understand the truth of this matter? Oh, Lord, I am working hard in the field, and the field of my labors is my own self, and I have become a problem to myself. I think we have all maybe felt that way sometimes. He takes a breath, as it were, and he tries again. The power of memory is great, O oh Lord. It is awe-inspiring, and it's profound and incalculable complexity. Yet it is my mind. It is myself. What then am I, my God? What is my nature? My God, my true life, what am I to do? I shall go beyond this force that is in me, this force that we shall call memory, so that I may come to you, my sweetness and my light. So he continues the search. See how I have explored the vast field of my memory in search of you, O Lord. Since the time when I first learned of you, you've always been present in my memory, and it is there I find you when I'm reminded of you and I delight in you. This is my holy joy. He realizes at last that God was always there, above him, below him, in him, sustaining him. And he wrote famously, I have learned to love you late. Beauty at once so ancient, so new. You were within me and I was in the world outside myself. You were with me, but I was not with you. The beautiful things of this world kept me far from you. And yet, if they had not been in you, they would have no being at all. You called me. You cried aloud to me. You broke my barrier of deafness. You shone upon me. Your radiance enveloped me. You touched me. And I am inflamed with love of your peace. Well, Augustine, like Teresa, is recognizing how vast is the human soul which is made to be a dwelling place for God. This was so much the case that Augustine confesses, as we have seen, a certain limit to knowability, even of himself. So to recap, we have two ideas to help us push back against the reductionism of anthropology today. Human contingency. We are not system dependent, but God dependent. Human transcendence. We are not small and enclosed, but we are spacious and open. 
to God. But we've also hinted now at a third idea suggested here by Augustine, human unknowability. We are not fully known, not exhaustively known by anyone, but only by God himself. To explain the contingent nature of our being, theologians will use the Latin phrase analogia entis, or analogy of being. We exist, God exists. But our existence isn't exactly the same as God's. It's analogical. We are finite, derivative, might not have been. God is infinite and self-determining. So we exist because God exists. We are created being. God is uncreated being. There's a passage in Balthazar where he says the highest instance of this, of the analogia entis, is the analogia personalitatis. That is, there's an analogy between personhood, human and divine. And I would like to draw out one aspect of this analogy as it pertains to knowability. So like we kind of parked a little bit on measurement or calculations in our earlier analysis. Now let's just park a little bit as we move towards conclusion here on the question of knowability. The persons of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternally open to each other in a communion of perfect love and knowledge. It is of the essence of personhood to be thus known in communion. So also for us. And yet as finite creatures, we are not able to know God exhaustively as he knows himself. For all that we know God truly and adequately in his climactic self-revelation in Jesus Christ, utterly sufficient, there's a remainder to our knowledge of God that is beyond our capacity. One might know more and more of God and know truly, but one can never know all. The theological phrase that specifies this is negative theology, not in the colloquial sense that there's anything negative or bad about God, but in the theological sense that once we have spoken of God, we must acknowledge that there is more that cannot be said. When we speak of God, it must therefore be with a chastened sense of the limits of our language to describe him. Our words, as Gregory Nyssa said, cannot circumscribe God in the sense of drawing a finite circle of words that encloses him entirely, got him inside our words. Theologians past and present have been careful to describe this unknowability in God as not in a proper sense, negative or dark. It is just so to us. It is in truth an excess of light, more light than we can take in, like looking at the sun. As the hymn writer says, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. To be circumspect in speaking of God is not the same as postmodern skepticism. In fact, in an interesting article, Jacques Derrida said he, he described he, the difference between post-structuralist indeterminacy and the Christian version. He said Christian apophasis is negativity without negativity. He knew it was really something positive. Is there, however, this is what I wanna draw out, an analogy here for the knowability of human persons. The place where the human and divine unknowability come together most significantly is in the revelation of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here the disciples for a moment beheld the glory of Jesus of Nazareth as the eternal son of God resplendent in divine light. This was also at the same time a revelation of our true humanity, the first and the last Adam, or as Irenaeus said, the glory of a man fully alive is being witnessed. In the Eastern iconographical tradition, the transfiguration holds central place. All icons are in a sense icons of this icon where archetypally we see earthly material substance bearing the weight of eternal divine glory. From the beginning of the tradition, the figure of Christ in a transfiguration icon radiating eternal light from beyond the walls of the world is surrounded by an almond-shaped full body halo or mandorla, as you see here. This is the sixth century mosaic icon of the transfiguration at St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai. 
Distinct from pagan uses of such devices, the mandorla or full body halo shades from light on the outer edges toward darkness at the center. This displays visually the, the theological point we have just been trying to make. John Chrysostom wrote about the disciples' experience on the mountain. For as eyes are darkened by an excess of splendor, so at that time also the exceeding greatness of the light weighed down the infirmity of their eyes. From this point forward, we see this motif consistently in the iconic um, iconography, in fresco, in Cappadocia, so there's the dark center, in fresco in uh, Cappadocia in the 11th century, on wood by the famous Russian icon writer Andrei Rublev in the early 15th century, where the dark center is presented in the shape of a star and, uh, and among his followers, and, um, and consistently in the Russian tradition thereafter. It's a Novgorod, and this is a modern uh, transfiguration icon. So God is revealed in Jesus Christ, but we cannot therefore know God exhaustively or even betterly and more dynamically. We may say with Gregory of Nyssa that although our knowledge of God will expand for all eternity, we will never get to the end of this knowing. What then is the analogia personalitatis here? It is this, if human beings are made in the image of God, made capable of God, intended for his likeness, and if in Christ Jesus we see the true humanity revealed as a human being divinized, as one standing in the presence of unending glory, transfigured by the indwelling presence of God. If all this is true, then may we not say by analogy that there ought to be a negative anthropology that corresponds to negative theology. As our knowledge of divine persons is limited and circumspect, so also we may say in a lesser way that our knowledge of human persons made in his image is also limited. If this is true, then this is a reason to be on guard against all modern anthropologies, implicit or explicit, that would reduce the human person to fit the heuristic tools of the observational human sciences. As they say to a hammer, everything is a nail. You only get the data that your tools are designed to see. Everything else is dark. Can I say that again? You look through your tools and see things, but everything else is what? Dark. A properly negative anthropology will always stand in awe of another human person as made in God's image and limit for this sake the claims made to explain human nature and behavior. On the basis of an analogia personalitatis, one will always remember that empirical research into human nature produces insight that's partial and heuristic. The person I know best in all the world after more than 35 years of marriage is my wife, Carolyn. Every day I come to know her more and more. As pure gift and undeserved grace, she has turned toward me in love, open to me, freely giving of herself to be known. And yet, as all lovers understand, I shall never, to the end of my days, come to the end of knowing her, no matter how many years the Lord gives us. If this is true of lovers, then how much more so for the knowledge we gain of one another through data collection and analysis? We never get to the end. C.S. Lewis preached his famous sermon, The Weight of Glory, in 1941, and he was developing the biblical understanding of glory and what it means that we are called to share in this glory. And at the end of the sermon, he drew out the implications. It may be possible, he said, let me... Um, Give this to you here. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet if at all only in a nightmare all day long we are in some degree helping each other to one of these destinations there are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal perhaps then while undertaking statistical analysis today 
of human beings, it's important to reimagine each person not as a data point, but as a unique human being transfigured, bathed in light supernal, resplendent in glory. Two years ago, Carol and I took a group of students away for a weekend prayer retreat on the uh, Sunshine Coast. Part of the time was spent in silent retreat. The students were off praying on their own and Carol and I were praying for them. We were praying for the prayers. While I was praying and calling to mind my students one by one, I had a quite overwhelming experience. It was not a vision as such, but it was though I could see the face of each of my students turned toward God in prayer, reflecting the divine glory that was turned toward them. I was looking at them, looking at God. It reminded me of those moments when you see the faces of those you love made beautiful by candlelight around the dinner table. Each of my students was unspeakably beautiful in the presence of God. And I was moved by the vision of each one clothed in light from beyond the world. As Augustine said, you shone upon me and your radiance enveloped me. This was a passing vision, but I think it witnessed to something important and true. It offered a glimpse of the anthropology we most need to recover in the midst of modern conditions, cat categories, and calculations. Even, friends, while you're reading epidemiological numbers, we should remember this. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Heinmarsh, for this insightful lecture, marvelous theme, and such an inspiring conclusion as well. Uh, we're really grateful for your work on this. And we're grateful as well that you'll remain with us for a discussion time here. Uh, so let me briefly introduce our audience and also invite them to submit questions to me or indications that you'd like to ask one. Uh, we have Amelia Hameter, who's a current student, Abigail Stocker, who's also a current student at Regent, and Paul Gutaker. Uh, who's an alumnus of the college. So welcome to the discussion time. And I think to kick it off, as you formulate your questions, I'll begin with one uh, for Bruce. So Bruce, thank you for this. And uh, it was a fascinating trip through the early modern period and the system of tariff penance and then the Ignatian examine of conscience, then on to the 18th century evangelicals and their turn ultimately from this quantitative way, but you also show a way that they include some of that in their ongoing qualitative work. I'm wondering if you could comment, uh, this fits your expertise, of course. I'm wondering if you could comment though a bit on the place of the Reformation, the 16th century Reformation. I'm wondering how directly the reformers might have targeted this kind of spiritual moral bookkeeping. I, I imagine that it was right for that with Ignatius writing on this, but wonder if you could play that out. And then if that attack was prominent, how can that speak to contemporary narratives that tie the Reformation, especially some of its unintended effects to some of the detrimental aspects of modern secular society? So can it show us a more liberating view of the Reformation? in light of the picture of modernity you've given us. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you. So um, one thinks of an example of somebody like Martin Luther who allegedly spent six hours in confession trying to remember everything, all the sins that he had committed and an unbelievable obsessive fastidiousness with, um, um, just suddenly forgot the name of his spiritual director. It's a quite likable figure. Um, and, um, and you can understand that Luther's big question was, how do I set my conscience at rest before a holy God? And it's a conscience formed by this kind of uh, fastidiousness. And, and whether his personality was a little bit obsessive compulsive, and he was already oriented that way, um, but he picked up all that was there in late medieval religion of this, everything that we trace from tariff uh, penance all the way forward, and he couldn't set his conscience at rest. And so this has been analyzed, uh, Jean Delumeau, um, even Christer Stendhal, about the Apostle Paul and the introspective conscience of the West in New Testament studies. People have looked at this and kind of wondered if, um, if there was a disproportionate kind of emphasis upon sort of moral fastidiousness and sin. But I think you're right, is Luther, this drove him crazy. This is sort of the theme of, um, 
Roland Bainton's sort of famous biography is he could not set his conscience at rest. And, and so there was a breakthrough, the breakthrough to justification, scholars call it the breakthrough to justification. He says it was though I had walked gone through, walked through gates of paradise, you know, when the when the insight finally came to him through a long period of biblical study culminating in his, in his tower experience and so on. So I think you're right, David, to put that at the heart of the Reformation and to take that um, that sense of um, liberation against the kind of overly quantitative tariffed sense of, um, you know, a, a medieval religion, that sort of cultic view of, uh, you know, appeasing God through ritual actions of priests on behalf of people and all those kinds of things that, that highly behavioral could be focused on, uh, gives us a little bit different picture of the Reformation than, um, than maybe sort of Brad Gregory's um, picture of the unintended Reformation as the kind of basis of modernity. There's, um, there's other things going on than just what emerges as the Reformation is all about discipline, right? That's one of the themes. And um, so our friend, uh, colleague, um, Regent alum, um, Ron Ritgers, has done some amazing work placing back at the center of the Reformation, consolation. It's a bit like those evangelicals that, that I was studying that needed to break through to an experience of the Holy Spirit and something deeply personal. And what Ron has pointed out is the stuff that was published and republished over and over again, way more than the 95 Theses or other kinds of documents were sermons on how to die, works of consolation in the midst of plague, midst of pandemic, and what it is to be consoled by the word of God. And um, rather than by this kind of fastidious uh, penitential system, but to be consoled by the word of God, placing consolation back at the very center of the Reformation. So I think it does give us a bit of, bit of a picture that it certainly complicates and um, that, that vision of the Reformation that was all about the solitary individual control and the movement of states towards discipline and that sort of thing. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Great, so we'll go to Paul next. Uh, Paul, go ahead with your question. Thanks again, Bruce. That was uh, a real treat, so much to think about. Um, and a lot that resonates, you know, one of the things that I found myself thinking and reading about is the ways in which the humanities, liberal, liberal arts education, um, places um, like Baylor where I teach, are under so much pressure to um, make that conversion from qualitative to quantitative, um, to sort of show what an education does in measurable um, you know, outcomes and these sorts of things. And so I just, I mean, that's just to underscore, I think I see everywhere this sort of conversion that you're talking about. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, where you see that um, not just sort of in the history of the church and early modern um, sort of thought, but I suspect that um, the church today, and I sort of hesitate to speak about the church in the abstract, but, but the churches and Christians today that our way of being together um, has been shaped by this quite a bit too. I mean, one, one example that comes to mind is this sort of, you know, if a denomination is growing, that means that the Lord is blessing us if it's shrinking, you know, that's because we, you know, some, some mainline denomination has made some sort of huge mistake and that's why their numbers are declining or whatever. And, and, and you know, either conservative or progressive um, branches of the church will, will sort of use this logic sometimes to, um, to justify some sort of position. Anyway, I'm curious if you see, if, if there's some more diagnosis you would do of the ways in which the church today, especially maybe North America, does this sort of thing. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. It's wonderful to talk about these things with you. I, um, I think the danger of, um, and I, I could be heard wrongly for saying, you know, statistic, statistical analysis and quantitative measurement is of the devil. And um, I think it has to be, what I'm wanting to argue is it has to be circumscribed everything outside of these measurements is dark. Like there's an irreducible complexity to people. But I think the danger as institutions, our modern churches, that it, it, an overemphasis upon data 
And of course, everybody could calculate their Google metrics and how long, how many seconds people are spending on your homepage before they go somewhere else. And churches can gather all this data. And we've all been on Zoom. So all we have is, 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 um, is uh, internet sort of data, but you can, you can be, get, and there's lots of data you can get, right? And you can survey your students and you're right, the humanities, we need to show longitudinally success factors and, and it's all, you know, give us the data. I think, I think there's a couple of dangers and, um, you know, and that argument from statistical success, but one is that the data tends to serve the institution more than the individual. And what I mean by that is um, we gather the data for the sake of the institution. And, um, and of course the argument is, and the healthier the institution, the better it is for individuals, but it means the ethic has kind of shifted from a deontological, well, let me see, in terms of medicine, the medical ethic should be the duty of care, Hippocratic, I need to do whatever is absolutely best for the person in front of me. And so all of my training, all of my service, all of my attention is dedicated to doing no harm and to a duty of care for the person in front of me. But epidemiological analysis is all utilitarian, the greatest good for the greatest number. And we move towards a, a set of calculations in which the individual can be sacrificed for the sake of the whole. And I think there's a danger of that kind of shift even within institutions is that we begin to think um, abstractly at a systemic level and the data is collected in, in those sorts of ways. And I think it can, it can distort our anthropology and it, and it needs to be circumscribed. These are, people are not interchangeable. People are utterly unique and complex. And so, um, yeah, there can be, yeah, there can be what, uh, I don't know if this is exactly right, but um, what our friend Kate Bowler at Duke would describe as soft, prepare, soft pro prosperity, a, pros a prosperity gospel, that is sort of a soft prosperity, which is this argument from success that it must be, if we're you know, successful, that God is blessing us kind of thing. And I think there's all sorts of ways to push back against that. And one of them is to recognize that the irreducible complexity, beauty, glory, and non-interchangeableness of each person that we're talking about. So I don't know exactly what that would look like when we still need to collect a certain amount of data. We need to improve our procedures and our practices because that serves people well. But it, um, but maybe, it, but it needs to be. We, we can at least be more chaste about what we think we're finding out and how successful we're being. You know, the positive psychologists will do this thing where. Um, you know, psychology should be in the service of human flourishing, not just psychopathology. So we feel like, you know, we want to improve humility in a population. And so we try to find out how to operationalize um, the marks of humility. We read lots of books on humility. We figure this is what humility is. And so we operationalize it by saying what one thing would be true of all these people who are humble that is, is highly operational, concrete, and behavioral. Then we survey a population for that. What is the salience of humility in this population at 63%? Then we run an intervention where we run a six week workbook program where people go through the workbook. And then we survey the population again to determine that we now have 76% humility in this uh, population. So therefore we've increased uh, humility. Well, the set of reductions that I had to go on to do that, to people being interchangeable to, to the complex understanding of a virtue like humility being reduced to these very narrow constraints is I think that the amount of insight that we've gained is kind of inflated. It's, uh, it's a bit illusory as to how much insight we've actually gained um, in that kind of a, a process. I think that can be repeated over and over again in sometimes the ways institution measures things and in, so, in some of these quantitative approaches. I think it's a real challenge in the humanities to try to you know, demonstrate that the most practical thing in the world is a good idea, you know, and how to, how to make that argument. Yeah. Thanks for that, Paul. We'll go to uh, Abigail next. Hey, Bruce, thanks for uh, this lecture. I really gave me all kinds of ideas that I think I'm going to be uh, mulling over for in the coming week. So um, I'm, I was, I was inspired by, um, especially your point about um, transcendence and 
when we talked about Augustine, really that we need to, um, th th there's more than we can even know about ourselves, but um, that some of knowing ourselves truly involves seeing ourselves in relation to God. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you could say more about what it looks like to do that in our current context. I think I look at Augustine and like, um, he's living in a different in a different time that's far less individualistic, right? At least in Western culture, I think saying we need to know ourselves more deeply and that there's a lot of space for um, for self-exploration, that's not an uncommon thing to think, but it can so easily turn into then self-actualization, right? Like I just need to try and understand myself in relation to myself more deeply. And there can be such a resist resistance to seeing ourselves and understanding ourselves in relation to another person um, or in, you know, in relation to something outside of ourselves. So I'm wondering if you could say more about how do we, how do we individually as well as, as the church, um, yeah, how do we navigate that mm. cultural moment we're in? Yeah, it's very good, Abigail. I think um, there is a version of understanding people as having enormous depth in the modern world. We think of the rise of psychodynamic psychology since Freud and so on, the aware that, that there's a vast reservoir within me that is unconscious, that is outside of, outside of what I know about myself. But I think for the most part in the modern world where we have become sort of imminent frame, Charles Taylor, we, we operate without that sense of transcendence. It's actually quite terrifying the unconscious, the id, the place of these unreconciled and suppressed desires and longings and um, terrifying things. So it's more like the old myth of Theseus and the labyrinth, that as I explore the labyrinth on the island of Crete, was it? And I find my way in there and it's bewildering trying to find my way in and explore my own interiority. What is at the center of the labyrinth for Theseus is the minotaur. It's the devouring monster. And the idea that uh, my own interiority is this kind of terrifying space. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, you know, in this new romantic sense of interior depths, wrote a letter where he said to a friend, I have had open to me, um, it was like this terrifying space in the infinity of my own nature. And so it's either an abyss that is terrifying or there might be a monster there. Which, which is why I call Teresa of Avila's interior castle an unlabyrinth, because it gets more clear toward the center. And at the center is not a monster, but it's the presence and love of the Holy Trinity dwelling within. And you move from darkness into light, and it becomes more and more manifest, clear, loving, and quiet. And it's the exact opposite. So I think, um, so that's just to say, the question of it not being about self-actualization or somehow I am inside myself like a Ziploc bag and I've got to figure this out um, and it's terrifying. I think that is kind of what we're left with in the modern period and uh, with technical helps and so on to try to figure that out. Um, but transcendence opens us to another whole possibility that is persons in relation is even my own interiority and the stuff I don't know about myself I'm held by a God of love who wants me to be blessed with his blessedness. And so for Augustine, isn't it interesting that as he explored very introspectively in a kind of Plotinian way, he kind of explored his own interiority, but how did he do it? The entire thing is written as a prayer. The entire exploration is actually not solitary. It is in the presence of God, in the presence of Christ. It's a little bit like counselors, um, you know, some counselors, Christian counselors, when dealing with trauma, they'll, they'll, they'll help to try to locate, like when you were there, and this was happening, to try to relive the experience, but actually see that God is there. And to actually, and that's kind of what Augustine was doing. I was there and where were you? And so the whole thing is a dialogue. So at one level, I think the Christian view of, of that sort of transcendence is, opens up something very fruitful, loving, and hopeful. Um, how we deal with this in, a, in, in practical terms within church life today, where we are all sort of so isolated in so many ways. 
on our little Zoom postage stamps and everything else. Um, I'm not sure. I think um, I, I think one one thing that surely has to matter is the irreplaceable face of the other is is to be face to face and to recognize who I am in the presence of another human being. And the more that we can do to maximize um, sort of elements of church life and institutional life that give space for the freedom and um, loving communion of persons with each other in, I think it's one of the reasons why somebody like Eugene Peterson talked about the importance of hospitality, you know, simple things, sharing a meal around a table have suddenly become very countercultural and ways in which uh, to contribute to human flourishing based on this kind of anthropology, the irreplaceableness of the other person, um, knowing ourselves in communion. Um, others will sure have more better practical ideas, but yeah. Great, we'll go to Amelia next. Hello, um, thank you also for this great lecture. This has been so much to think about and so relevant. Um, and it, I really appreciate what you've said about systems and how quantitative analysis in the modern world is so contingent on the systems that we have in place. And so much of modern life relies on not just economics, but public health, everything that is so in cultured in, um, sorry, I'm still trying to think how to word my question, but basically um, I was thinking about what you said about how we also aren't as keen on local observation and relationships. And even just now having lost so much of the value of hospitality and just personal community relationships. And I was thinking about how quantitative analysis is so, or it feels very necessary in our practices and organizations and institutions, partly because of the scale at which we work. Um, it's harder to do qualitative analysis if you're evaluating 50 different workshops instead of just two that happened in your own city. So I'm curious if you have more thoughts on how local versus larger scale, long distance um, systems work. And yeah, I guess whether that is a large factor in this and if so, how we might approach that. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. You guys are asking hard questions. What does this actually mean in practice, right? What do we do with this? Um, I think it does help to remember, I was reading uh, Giorgio uh, Agamben, an Italian philosopher writing about the pandemic. He was just talking about people being so afraid and the path out of it, he said, he doesn't think it's to reason with people so much as it's to remember a condition of being in the world and the world presenting itself to us as a gift is that we will sometimes be afraid. And we need to remember the prior sense of the world that is an unspeakable gift that I am present to the world and the world is present to me. I have an Illich, um, it's almost a romantic idyll in some ways, but he talks about the home as a um, cocoon or a womb, the neighborhood as gift and the land as sustaining. And I think recovering that kind of sense to act personally, you know, okay, this is, here's a little cameo for me. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, after my father's death on hold with CRA, with the Canada Revenue Agency. Typically, I take pictures of my phone, like three hours or more on hold, trying to get through to an agent. It was like this when we were in England, trying to get home, calling Air Canada. It's just hours of waiting, right? Like this is a way that the system is not working. The system in which on which I'm dependent is beginning, as Ivan Ilse would say, the system begins to do harm that's meant to do good. Um, but one of the things for me is just part of my nature and personality and so on. For a while, you know, in a way that's very embarrassing as a professor of spiritual theology, I could be very unkind to the call to the agents at the other end of the phone when I finally get through. And I could be really snarky in ways that if it was recorded, I'd be very embarrassed. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I just decided, no, every time I get through, I'm, I want to be your best phone call today. Whoever's at the other end of the phone, whoever is looking at a computer and trying to give me an answer and looking things up, it's like, I want to be, you know, the easiest person you've talked to today. And I want to ask a few questions about you if I'm allowed to, and I want to be deeply personal. So I think there's ways, there's a little kind of revolutionary you know, cells we can have to act deeply personally within systems. 
Um, there may be larger questions about how to reform these systems and larger kind of changes that people can think about. But meanwhile, you know, um, it's like David Foster Wallace in his famous uh, commencement address, this is water, where he talks about, you don't know the person who cut you off, you know, in traffic, uh, the, the person at the grocery till, you have no idea of their individual personal history. Maybe their dad just got diagnosed with cancer. Uh, maybe they're going through a divorce. And so what does it mean to treat each person not as the this cashier is delivering a commodity system on my behalf and they aren't moving fast enough, but to begin to act in ways that are deeply personal. I think this kind of anthropology is precisely one of the things that can help us to act that way when the world we're in for all its goodness, some of these systems have become quite dehumanizing. Okay, we'll go, we probably have time for one or two more questions. So we'll go to Paul next. <clears throat> yeah, Bruce, um, I just continue to think about um, the risk avoidance quote that you had from Illich and then the, the sort of the sense in which calculation may be a kind of vice um, or maybe a way of keeping God at a distance. Um, and I'm just wondering if you think that there's a sense in which that's the case. Is, is there, when we think about our own relationship with the Lord, is there a sort of need for a holy lack of calculation? I mean, we need discernment, we need wisdom, but is there something calculating that is a sort of modern vice. I mean, I, I think of Mary's yes, you know, to the, to the word from the angel, um, a, a complete opposite of risk avoidance, taking on enormous risk um, without calculation. So I just wonder, is there, do we need to sort of name this as a vice that needs, um, needs pruning in our lives or, or um, maybe even um, to just say no to it? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure it's a vice it, um, but I think it's almost like you got to say, keep, keep in your lane, like don't overstep the bounds. Don't claim too much for what you're claiming. Uh, the kinds of things that can be done with statistic anal statistical analysis is absolutely amazing. I've been reading a lot of scientific papers and trying to train myself to read some of these papers and try to understand what's going on in the last um, 18 months. And um, I wish I'd done a stats course in college. And But looking at what people can do, even in these amazing meta-analyses and the way they can sort through multiple randomized control trials and create these force plots where they are able to, act, to determine whether what they're seeing, to sort through a massive amount of data and what they're seeing, whether it's actually chance, what's the likelihood that this is chance, whether it moves onto the other side of the line and they actually go, this is not chance. The signal that we thought we saw is actually something real. And all of that, that, that is productive of medical good and other kinds of goods. So I wouldn't want to say, you know, um, calculation is a vice. Maybe what we need to say is, is it, there is a temptation. There's a temptation and the temptation is as so often is control. And, uh, and where do we need to recognize that we're not in control or that what we're, for all that we're seeing outside of what we're seeing, it's dark. And what we know is bounded by what we don't know. And so there needs to be a, a chastened sense. But I love what you said about Mary's fiat mihi, let it be to me, as paradigmatic of our response to a world where we cannot simply calculate an uncertain future. You know, uh, Pascal, Fermat, we don't just calculate an uncertain future and act accordingly. We are radically willing to enter into a world that is contingent where we don't know what will happen. Hannah Arendt wrote about um, how terrifying is the act of life, where you have to act in the world. When she said, there's the problem of uncertainty. We don't know, um, we don't know the implications of our actions. We don't know what will follow downstream of our actions. There's the problem of uncertainty. And secondly, there's the problem of uh, permanence. We can't take it back once we've acted in the world. 
And it's terrifying to act in the world when you can't take anything back, no take backs once you've acted and you have no idea because you're finite where this is going to go. And she said, the way we need to act therefore in the world is the only way to deal with the problem of um, uncertainty is to keep promises, be little islands of faithfulness within an uncertain world, keep promises. And the only way to deal with uh, the problem of permanence is forgiveness. And so it's Hesed and Emmet. It's love and faithfulness. It's grace and mercy. It's the only way to live in the world is to be faithful and to keep promises and to deal uh, the problem of, of permanence. And I think of the social media world where there's no atonement, no atonement for anything and nothing can ever be taken back and everything is always permanent. And, and years later it can be found, but to try to act in the world in a way that, um, that is redemptive like that, but also that attitude that is spirit, spiritually fundamentally uncalculating is, um, is risking all, you know, for the sake of Christ, uh, placing myself entirely at the service of the person who presents themselves to me as the absolute demand of the face of another human being. Uh, that doesn't make calculations that are utilitarian. I think these are really important ways to operate. So calculation is, I think, a temptation. It's the same in the financial world where all this risk analysis goes on. And I feel for people who, you know, financial advisors, whose entire world is based on calculating an uncertain future, trying to mitigate geographical risk, sector risk, um, you know, uh, uh, inflation risks, policy risks, geopolitical risks, trying to manage. And, and if you think about, if, you, if that's the way you think all the time, it'll drive you crazy, you know? And so as Christians, I think we begin, we begin with Mary um, saying yes and not knowing the future. And um, Lucy Shaw has a poem that has the line in it as if no one had ever said yes like that. So I think, why don't we, does that make sense, Paul? It's not necessarily a vice, but it is a temptation. Yeah. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thanks for that, Bruce. Could I squeeze in one last question before we go here? Let's do it. Uh, so I, I wonder if, um, when you talk about control, it's certainly something that you've you've well illustrated as something we we do to other persons and have done to us. Uh, it's also something that certainly we've done to to nature, creation, and other creatures. And I wonder your title says mere mortal, not mere human. And I wonder what might be here for. Um, how we look at other creatures. So, you know, you, you've got these transfiguration icons and some recent theologians have pointed out that um, it says that the word became flesh and you have that sen fuller sense. Certainly Jesus is a human being, but you have a fuller identification with uh, creatureliness, uh, with created flesh. And so I wonder if you could say a word or two about the what this personalist vision means for our relations beyond other persons. Well, I think that's very good. I think there is a, a way that the same contingency and the same awareness, um, but you're right, David, the sort of orthodox world and way of thinking about the incarnation is that um, if God himself has joined him, if God has joined himself, to human flesh into the material world then somehow the destiny of the material world is caught up in the destiny of god himself now the entire and and why the transfiguration icon is paradigmatic and i think it's the first icon that an icon writer will will, will write or paint like it's the first one because what it's showing us is that the material is able to bear the weight of the eternal and and it, it can be radiant with divine glory and divine presence so that wood and uh, paint and lapis lazuli and all of that can actually um, be sacramental, can be a window that the eternal is present. And that, that view of, I think, the, the created world pushes back against it simply being a resource 
or pushes back against ways in which creation is exploited, that I think there can be a, maybe not an analogia personalitatis, but something like that in how we view creation more sacramentally, that also has those kinds of ethical implications that I think you're hinting at. And that, um, um, that there's a richer sense of, um, you know, all creatures of our God and King um, that can, um, these, are, these are all creatures that you have never met a mere creature, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for that. And thank you again so much for this sophisticated treatment of the theme. It's really an exciting direction in the personalist vision that has been so important in, at Regent College. Uh, so thank you for that, Bruce. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight as tonight's audience. Uh, we appreciate you spending time with us to consider this important topic of how we conceive of ourselves and one another. Thanks also to those who asked questions. So Amelia, Abigail, and Paul, much appreciated uh, your time with us here. Thanks finally to our generous donors who make possible events like this and the courses that run alongside them and that are running all summer long. A few final announcements. We've got a lot of free lectures coming up this summer. So if you enjoyed this evening, please sign up to stay informed about uh, great events that are happening at Regent. So to do so, you can go to rgnt.net slash subscribe. That's rgnt.net slash subscribe. That will take you to our email subscription form and we can keep you up to date with uh, public lectures, courses, and other events that are coming up. Also, if you'd like to become a donor and contribute to our financial aid fund for students, uh, making the, the personalist encounter, the encounter between students and professors like uh, Dr. Hindmarsh uh, more available, please visit our website, rgnt.net slash give. That's rgnt.net slash give. Thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>